Greetings, everyone. We are here with you again as we continue and actually as we conclude our series on the Ten Commandments. Um, this is our, our fourth and final week on the Ten Commandments. Um, so with no further ado, I will read uh, from Exodus 20. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. God of goodness and grace, it is very difficult for us um, living in community, uh, seeing other people all the time. Um, very difficult sometimes for us not to want what others have. Um, so we ask two gifts. One, that you make us content with um, with what you give to us, and two, that you help us to satisfy the basic needs of those who don't have enough um, to make it from day to day. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'll, I'll, I'll let you kick things off here, Craig. Well, let's uh, <clears throat> just kind of refresh everything here, these commandments. I, I think it's been, it's been helpful for me and good for me to to revisit those, even though you think you know them all, I think to focus on them and hear some uh, response to that is a good, good thing to do. And overall, uh, again, God set God's people free, brought them out of a place of captivity and brought them now to a new place and wanted to show them what it meant to be free people. And because they had such a long history of being captive with multiple gods and multiple kind of things that were uh, just taking away what God had designed for them to be. So now they're in a new place and how do you keep living a free life and not falling back into captivity of another kind? And that's how, the, that's how I understand these commandments were given. First, set you free, and then by God's grace, we are given these commandments so that we don't fall back into captivity of other kind. And so I, I think this word covet is uh, one that is quite easily, very subtly, one that you can become a captive to very quickly, uh, especially as we live in our Western culture of, of multiple choices of how to make your life better or improve upon. Uh, everything is new and improved. And if you don't have it, uh, it makes it look like you're, you're not with it. So the coveting, I think, is, a, is an ongoing driving force here for us. So I think it's good I also just to focus on one commandment sometimes. I, at first I thought, well, you know, why would we just pick on this one? But I, I think it's a, a very timely piece for all of us. <clears throat> you know, um, thinking about that business of captivity, I, I think back to when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees um, and he said, if the son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. And mm -hmm. their response was, what do you mean that we will be free? You know, we've never been, you know, slaves to anyone. We've never been captive to anyone. And, yeah. of course, that was not true, um, because looking into, you know, their history, they had been slaves for 430 years. But we, um, you know, those of us who live in, in this country, we can quite honestly say, um, what do you mean we'll be set free from our captivity? We've never been slaves to anyone. Um, yeah. So um, what does it mean to us then that we've been set free and that we've been given these commandments so that we may no longer be in ca captivity? What, what does that mean to us? Well, I, I think I would begin by saying I think freedom begins with identity here. Uh, it is who I am in Christ. Uh, so the freedom comes for me in having that relationship of God's grace by faith in Christ alone. And then I, I think how I live out that life, uh, both in terms of forgiveness and the work of the Holy Spirit trying to guide and direct my thoughts and actions, I think uh, would lead me to believe that's as close as I can come to being free. I think we live in a culture, though, where... Uh, most, well, most, some would say, uh, if you don't have rules, then you, then you found freedom. When you can get away from all the rules that inhibit you and tell you what to do and how to live your life and direct, then that's freedom. And I, uh, as I said, a couple of weeks ago, I, 
I, I bought into that. Uh, and when I went off to college, I thought I was going to be the freest uh, bird of all. And it wasn't long before uh, my freedom became captivity. And I was starting to figure out a few things that I didn't want to become captive to. And the other reality is that if you have that kind of freedom and you also um, have power or authority, then your freedom becomes other people's oppression. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's that's not the, the freedom that we're talking about at, at all. And, you know, this business about not coveting, um, as we pointed out in... Our, our staff meeting earlier, this is the only commandment that has to do with something other than um, what you do or, or don't do. Um, this has to do with, you know, your, your desires, um, yeah. your wants. And we are, we, we are very much um, in captive. Um, that's, not the right English, but you know what I mean. Um, because we our our culture is a consumer culture, um, yeah. and our culture is all about making us want things. Um, our culture is all about making us envious or covetous of things that we don't yet have. Um, it's like coveting and stealing are pretty close to holding hands. Hmm. I, I like what you're, the distinction is that, you know, coveting is not taking, uh, but I think it, it, it's, it's a consuming kind of fire that burns inside of you. And, and in your prayer, opening prayer, I think you would use the word content or contentment, which I think is very much the opposite. If you keep living covetous life, you will never find contentment or be satisfied with what God has blessed you with. So this is truly an offense, not just against your neighbor, it is also, and greater still, an offense against God who provides, as we say, daily bread, day after day, even without our asking. And if we're not content with it, uh, that's offensive. Yeah, and it's it's like, um, you know, Mr. Bigger Barnes, um, that yep. Jesus tells the parable about, um, yep. who had so much that he had to, you know, build new silos to put his stuff in. Um, and, you know, Jesus was, you know, when you die, whose will this be? You know, yeah. um, and why do you need to always have more and more and more? Um, and I remember the, you know, I, I've, I've seen this meme on Facebook that um, if scientists were studying a group of monkeys and there was one or two of the monkeys who continually gathered many, many more bananas than they could eat. And some of the monkeys went hungry because of that. Um, we would study that and we would say there is something wrong with that one or two monkeys. But when people do that, we worship them. Um, yeah. and, and it's true. It's true. I mean, when people hoard, when people gather more than they could ever use, um, you know, millionaires, billionaires, um, and, and there are others who don't even have daily necessities. We admire those people because we want to be like them. Yeah, yeah. It's sick. <laughs> I, I, and I, for me, uh, at the age I'm at now, I'm finding uh, there's some beauty in getting into your mid-70s. There's, I think there's more of a realization that you know, there's focus on the things that are more, of more importance rather than what my neighbor has, just what I've already been given, just to enjoy that. And it, I think it moves closer to contentment or this peace that passes all understanding. But I think it is a, it's an ongoing struggle for some of our younger people, even at a very young, young age. Um, I mean, if you have a, a phone uh, that's of, you know, a number three versus a number 12, uh, that isn't going to get you anywhere uh, in that little world. Uh, they're going to make fun of you if your phone is only a, a three and, uh, and 12, 13, 14, 15 has just come out here. So there's an envious kind of coveting, wanting to increase my popularity or my status with my friends and my neighbor. Yeah, very much so, very much so. And, you know, I... Um... <laughs> I think you've probably heard me say this before that when I um, listen to the news or, or 
watch the news on TV, which I do very seldom or, or read, I am so tired of being referred to as a consumer. Yeah. Um, I'm never referred to as a citizen. Yeah. Um, I'm never referred to, you know, very seldom as a, a Christian or a father or a friend or a husband. I'm always a consumer. Um, mm -hmm. And that's really, you know, we have, like I said, an entire culture that's built around um, creating in us uh, an acquisitive nature, a covetous nature, um, yeah. so that we will keep consuming and consuming and consuming. And for younger people, especially, uh, I think brand name and the name on a product uh, is quite important. Um, I happen to grow up in a house where my dad uh, was the sole provider there as a school teacher, and we didn't have the kind of means that you could go out and just uh, buy the best and the name brand stuff. But I remember some of my friends did, and uh, there there was a struggle there. I also recall a time, and and I don't know where these flashbacks come from, but we couldn't have been more than six, seven, eight years old, three of us, good friends. And I had this, it was a beautiful semi truck, metal, just shiny red. And it was uh, the pie was the initials on it, Pacific Intermountain Express. And I was the envy of every kid of those of the three of us there. And I remember I left it out one day and it was gone the next day and I never ever found out. But I'm guessing that one of my close friends ended up with my truck uh, because that desire to have something that he didn't have just overtook him. And I think even your best friends, even the best friendships sometimes are not a guard against wanting what they have. You'll yeah. go and get it. And that's why I say, I think coveting is awful close to stealing, even though one is more of a fire inside or a passion uh, that has to be, I think, squelched. But when you actually steal something, uh, that's, that's another act, an outward act. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a very it's it's a very interesting commandment um, yeah. that that we have this week. Um, that as Christians, I, it's really tough, and and as Christians and as um, Jews, of course, that we're told um, to discipline ourselves, even to the point of not having certain feelings, um, yeah. which um, is very difficult. I think very, very difficult. I think coveting is also one of those things that you can keep quiet inside of you. It, and it, it isn't necessarily revealed other than it shows up in your not being content with what you have. It leads to kind of an unhappiness or a, <clears throat> a position of kind of anxiety of knowing that you want more, but don't know how to get it. Which is why being in conversation with others, um, being in the habit of confessing, yeah. You know, those are all important things because then you get that out, you talk about it, you know, and, and people, you know, um, brother and sister Christians can um, help you deal with that. And isn't that, I mean, that's a, that's a form of freedom that comes rather than sitting captive by yourself, you know, kind of an outward confession. That would be, you know, we use that in our liturgy all the time too. We should maybe, maybe draw some parallels about it's time to set ourselves free and open up and Tell our neighbor that we uh, we're fighting all these battles, and so are they. Yep, good place to wrap it up. I think draw a line there. Sure. Okay, everybody have a, a great week. I understand it's going to be warm midweek, and then it's going to be beautiful again for the weekend. So do enjoy it. Yep. Take care.